Good morning, and welcome to worship at the CGH Charge. If you were on just a minute ago, um, the phone fell. <laughs> and so we were live, and then we were not live. But we are live now, and it is wonderful to have you with us. I am really fortunate I not only have one granddaughter here with me this morning, I have two. Say hello, Kylie. Hello. <laughs> Say hello, Marissa. Hi. That was Marissa you heard laughing because they had the volume up. <laughs> We're having a little technical difficulty. Anyhow, it's good to have you here with us today. I have a couple announcements. One is there will be no Bible study tonight uh, on Wednesday night. And the other thing, the um, Homestead Avenue is going to have an informational meeting about uh, their budget uh, for the council. The leadership council will be... Tuesday at six o'clock. And at some point, um, Grove Avenue is going to have to have a meeting uh, to uh, discuss the coming year's budget. And that one will be on Zoom. I know you'd like to get together, but we can't really do that because we have some people that don't feel comfortable doing that. So we need to accommodate them. Homestead's Ave uh, Avenue's meeting is in person. So we are so glad to have you with us today. Our call to our prelude today is "All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name," and Denise Baldwin is singing.
beautiful. We are so blessed to have Denise um, provide musical um, music for us for the Facebook worship services. Our call to worship today. For those who have not been welcomed before, you are welcomed by Christ. For those who have been turned away, Christ is opening the door for you. For those who have been forgotten, God will not forget you. For God made you. Come and worship our God. You are God's beloved. We welcome each other in the name of Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we remember the many ways that you've helped us and you've saved us. We listen for your word for us today. Touch our hearts with your healing mercy, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first scripture reading today is Psalm 90, and we're reading verses 1 through 6 and 13 to 17. So hear these words. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the or for, before you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turned us back to dust and say, Turn back, you mortals, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past, or like a watch in the night. You sweep them away, they are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the morning it flourishes and is renewed, in the evening it fades and withers. Turn, O oh Lord, how long? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love, so that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad as many days as you have afflicted us and as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be manifest to your servants for your glorious power to your children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and prosper for us the work of our hands. O oh, prosper the work of our hands. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Our first opening hymn is What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
true. Thou will find a solace there. Our sermon today is taken from uh, first, um, the text is 1 Thessalonians and the second chapter. Now, this little part of Thessalonian gives us a glimpse of Paul the Apostle as an evangelist and also as a builder of communities of faith. And it's a compelling model uh, that outlines the main purpose of a church, to reach and to teach people as we worship God. The text provides the ideal servant, what an ideal servant looks like. It's kind of like a continuing ed program for disciples. Paul wrote this letter because the religious leaders were slandering him. They were saying he did what he did out of personal gain. So Paul provides a review of his ministry, and he hopes it's going to silence the attacks and also protect the work that the Lord had accomplished through Paul and his partners in ministry. So hear these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8, and I'm reading from the NIV Bible. As you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, our visit with you wasn't a waste of time. On the contrary, we had the courage through God to speak God's good news in spite of the opposition. Although we had already suffered and were publicly insulted in Philippi, as you know, our appeal isn't based on false information, the wrong motives, or deception. Rather, we have been examined and approved by God to be trusted with the good news, and that's exactly how we speak. We aren't trying to please people, but we're trying to please God, who continues to examine our hearts. As you know, we never use flattery, and God is our witness. We didn't have greedy motives. We didn't ask for special treatment from people, not from you or from others, although we could have thrown our weight around as Christ's apostles. Instead, we were gentle with you like a nursing mother caring for her own children. We were glad to share not only God's good news with you, but also our very lives because we cared so much for you. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, have you ever been falsely accused of something or criticized? You know, it's hard to take. It hurts our feelings. And we're concerned that people might actually believe the lies that others are telling about us. Frequently, it seems like false criticism doesn't stem so much around what we've done or what we failed to do, but what our motives were. What were our intentions? Now, some people believe that Paul was preaching the gospel to enhance his own self-interest, to put forward his own agenda. And according to critics, the impetus for building up the body of Christ was not for the sake of the gospel, but for Paul's own personal financial gain, the collections. He was accused of hiding his greed behind his preaching about God's grace. Now, throughout his ministry, Paul had experienced a variety of physical afflictions and verbal assaults. He had the pain of the rod and the ache from being in the stocks and the chains, and the hunger pains in his stomach, and the heartbreak from friends abandoning him and enemies tormenting him. And all this suffering did not make Paul bitter. It made him better. It made him stronger. It made him more equipped to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, we like easy things. And so often we focus on the glory of servanthood instead of on the suffering. That's a reality, suffering because of our servanthood. Paul reminds us if we suffer with Christ, we will reign with Christ in glory. Paul was inspired by Jesus Christ. And like Jeremiah he had fire in his bones and he couldn't keep quiet. And like Simon Peter, he was compelled to just share so others would know. 
Paul was aware that there were charlatans and snake oil salesmen, and he reminds the church that his ministry was authentic. It's an extension of the Holy Spirit. His message was one of truth and sincerity, not flattery. Paul did not seek human approval. His message was from God, and so he sought God's approval. As Paul defends his ministry, he shows us what Christian servants, what Christian disciples look like. And he outlines a vision for Christian service. Well, this vision just isn't for people who are labeled as leaders. It's for all of us. Leadership is about influence. Every one of us has someone that we influence. Every one of us has someone who's looking up at us observing us. And so who are we leading to Christ? And who, and just as importantly, who are we leading away from Christ because of our actions and our words? Think about somebody who's influenced you, someone who has impacted your life, someone you aspire to be like, someone you would call a good leader. What characteristics does that person have? What draws you to him or her? What makes that leader effective? Well, today we're going to look at two traits that good Christian leaders should have, two traits that all of us should have. We have to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ through our words and through our actions, through how we use our resources. It doesn't matter what it costs. We have to reach people for Christ. Paul kept his message really simple and pure. He told him the good news. He told him how we're all sinners, how God is holy, how we deserve judgment because of our sins, but how Jesus, because of his great love, died for us, and how he rose from the dead. And because of that, we have hope. We have hope here and now, and we have hope for the future. Everywhere Paul ministered, He sought to please God, not people. He sees himself as a steward of the good news. We're also, we're stewards of God's word. We're stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have been given a message and we've been entrusted with it. We can't squander it. We can't drop the ball. It's humbling that we've been given this job, but it's also liberating. We have been set free, free to boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul declared the gospel in the face of strong opposition. He's telling us we should never get comfortable. We have to forge ahead through the pain. We have to expect there's going to be flack. And we're going to have to let it roll off. We have to develop thick skin. The gospel of Jesus Christ is power. And when we faithfully proclaim it, the Holy Spirit gets involved and big things happen. But we have to be faithful. Paul also reminds us what he didn't do. He didn't come to deceive. He didn't, it wasn't a bait and switch plan. He knew that the enemy loves to use counterfeit messengers to develop to de deliver counterfeit messages to lead people astray to discredit the gospel paul didn't sugarcoat things he didn't uh, avoid the hard issues he didn't try to manipulate people or play on their emotions he didn't use his power and prestige for his own needs or his own personal agenda he didn't say whatever the culture wants him to say. He boldly proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, we've been given the gospel message, and we're also meant to handle it carefully. We're meant to present it faithfully. And we're to call upon the power, the power of God, 
so that we can honestly and faithfully proclaim the good news. So that's the first thing we have to do. Proclaim the good news through everything that we do and say and how we use our resources. The second characteristic is love. Paul overflows with love for the church and for the people. Paul had been nurtured by a number of people, Ananias, Barnabas, and others, and he shared with believers, the sincere milk of the gospel that had nourished him. And he did that because he loved them. And Paul became vulnerable. He bared his heart and entered into Christian fellowship with them. You know, in today's world, Paul has been accused of being a male chauvinist, and I can understand people's feelings about that. And yet in today's text, he uses a, a feminine image to describe himself. He views his ministry among the people at the churches as a mother nursing her child. Now, those of us who are mothers, we remember the incredible joy and love that we felt as, and the bonds that were formed as, as we held and we fed our babies. Paul knows that a relationship between a mother and her baby is something special. You know, calling himself a dad wasn't strong enough for Paul in this text. Um, a man made a, a, a comment, his name is John Stott, and he said, it's a lovely thing that a man as tough and masculine as the Apostle Paul should use this feminine metaphor. What a beautiful portrayal of Christian nur nurture. Christian leaders need to develop gentleness and love and self-sacrifice, the same kind that a good mom has. And so we not only are to share the gospel with people, we're to share ourselves because we love them. The Lord calls us to faithful and sacrificial service. And it isn't just pastors and church leaders. It's all of us. We're all servants. We're all ministers. We're all laborers for the gospel. We need to combine boldly proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ with our love, with our love for God and our love for people. Some of us are so concerned about preaching the pure gospel, but we're not so good about caring for people or building relationships. We're not so good at meeting people where they are and helping them to fulfill their needs. We may be preaching the truth, but sometimes there's not a whole lot of love there. Some of us have the opposite problem. We try to love people but we're not bold with God's word. And we don't say what needs to be said sometimes because we're afraid of hurting people's feelings. That's not love. Truth without love is not really truth. And love without truth is not really love. We need both. We need to speak the truth and do the truth in love. So let's go back to that person I asked you to think about who influenced and impacted your life. I bet they did both of those things. They spoke the truth to you in love. I bet he or she taught you the truth, sometimes saying hard things to you, but things you needed to hear. But I also bet that person did it because they love you. You could sense their love and their affection to you through their words and their actions. I hope that each and every one of us exemplify those characteristics as we reach people for Christ and build up the church. Paul spoke the truth in love. He proclaimed the true gospel and he loved God and the people. The fruits of the church in uh, the Thessalonian church came about because Paul was faithful, faithful in speaking the truth in love. And we too must be faithful in proclaiming the gospel 
in love. There's a cost, but there's also a reward. And when things get really tough, when people stand against us, we have to continue to do our job and speak the truth in love. And if we're faithful, God will bless us and our ministries. Lord, make it so. Amen. Let us pray. Oh, loving Lord, we're living in a world right now where so many people think they have the truth. But we're afraid it's not your truth, Lord. It's their own personal version of the truth. And Lord, we are living in a world where people um, put their views and opinions before their concern and love for others. So Lord, help us to learn how to speak your truth in love. Because Lord, we know that love covers a multitude of sins. And we pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Kylie is writing down our prayer request, and as she does, uh, we are going to have our prayer song, which is Here I Am, Lord.
Amen. I will hold your people in my heart. That's love. Uh, we have some joys and concerns. I just like to lift them up now so that we can uh, talk about it. Continuing prayers for people impacted by coronavirus, whether it is because of um, illness or because of economic loss or because of isolation. The virus has impacted so many people in many ways. So we want to lift them up, lift up our church and our charge, our nation and this upcoming election, Beth and Seth, Bev and Seth, Alyssa, Ariana, and Zamir. Pastor Deb is not feeling well today, so we need to lift up Pastor Deb, and I hope Ernie is taking good care of her. Uh, Denise and Lois are coming back from Nashville, so we, we're lifting them up. The Queen of uh, Peace Parish in Patton, please pay, pray for the parishioners there. Also for Karina, safe travels for my son and his wife, Ian and Michelle. Prayers for victims of hurricanes, flooding, fires, and unspoken. We want to lift up Marilyn and Glenn Orris, who are up at our Butis Manor. They are quarantined again. Um, for the uh, Ringler family, whose mom um, passed away um, recently. So those are all. And, and I would ask for prayers for myself. I have to tell you, um, three, 13 years ago, I entered an adventure. And it involved... Um, my husband, John, his son, Spencer, his dog, Snip, and my dog, Skylar. Friday, um, I had to take Skylar to the vet, and he was put to sleep. So five of us started the adventure, and I'm the only one left. So um, it's a little lonely, but good. I'm waiting to see what next adventure I'm going to have. I don't think it can compete with John Hickman, and <laughs> Marissa's laughing at that, and the crazy dog that he brought with them. <laughs> we also have some joys. Alan and Joyce Leckenfeld, 44 years of being married. Congratulations. And I would ask, uh, it's a joy that Rich and Lulu Morasca are home from Guatemala. They are uh, missionaries there. So um, they will be speaking at Homestead and Grove Avenue on the 8th of November. So that's exciting. Pastor Brittany and Dirk Wooten had a beautiful baby boy, seven pounds, five ounces, Payson Wooten. So uh, blessings to them. Also, uh, we lift up um, everyone who worships with us, whether it be in the congregations or whether it's on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for uh, worshiping uh, with us. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. O oh, everlasting God, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Since the creation of the world, you have nurtured us with your love. You are our God forever, and we are your people forever. We feel your love washing over us, and we celebrate your love in our lives. And we ask for your power so that we can boldly share the good news. Oh, we're in the midst of frightening times when anger seems to be the way to treat others. It seems to be the way to respond to difficulties. Oh, Lord, be merciful to us. We don't want to live this way. We seek your peace, your healing, your love. Oh, Lord, we shamefully acknowledge that we don't always demonstrate your love. We don't always share your love. We're selective about who we choose to love. You know, we want to live, we want to love people that are like us and that talk right and seem safe. But, Lord, Dig deeper into our souls. Expose our selfishness for what it is. Expose our fears. Engage us in ministries of justice that require us 
to not only say the right things or to give money, but to give of ourselves. Free us and inspire us to love. Empower us to love ourselves. And then move us, move us, Lord, to use the gifts that you've given us so that we may be in service in your name. Teach us to love you more fully so our lives will show your truth and your love and fill our hearts for, for concerns, not only of our family and friends, but with everyone who's facing difficulties. We lift up those who stand in need of your care. We know, Lord, that you will hear our cries and respond in love. And we lift up Bev and Seth and Alyssa and Ariana and Zamir and Pastor Deb and Denise and Lois and everyone impacted by the COVID. The congregation of the Queen of Peace Parish the Ringler family, Marilyn and Glenn Orris, the victims of hurricanes and flooding and fire, and safe travels for Ian and Michelle. Lord, hear our prayer. But in the midst of darkness, your light shines forth. And we lift up those people and those circumstances that have caused us to rejoice with delight and love. And we lift up Alan and Joyce and Rich and Lulu and Payson Wooten and his parents and everyone who worships with us and and these churches that we serve, this community. Be with us, Lord. Heal our wounds. Direct our lives. These things we offer in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, if Pastor Deb is watching at home, and Ernie, if you're with Pastor Deb, it's time for you to leave because I'm going to be reminding people to mail your tithes and offerings into um, the churches. If you belong to the CGH charge, please send your offering to one of the churches. And if you do not, if you attend another church, please send your offering to that church. Um, They're needed to provide, uh, to continue to provide servicing. Our going out hymn today is... You will know you are Christians by our love. And that's what I hope. The people will know that we know Christ, that we have a personal relationship with Christ because how we share that. Kylie's looking confused. They'll know we are Christians by our love. They're getting it. Some of us are older. We remember sitting around campfires singing this song in the late 60s and early 70s. Marissa thinks that's quite funny because that was like ancient history. It's coming.
my prayer for each and every one of us that people will look at us and how we have ordered our lives and that they will know that we are Christians. May God's love surround you and uphold you and empower you to be agents of love as you speak boldly God's truth in the world. Just a reminder, um, it will be uh, sent out real soon. November 10th at 6.30 is our charge conference. So for the next week, we're going to be working diligently, getting everything ready to conduct our yearly business meeting. And as we leave today, um, I leave you with God's peace. Shalom. Christ truly be your shalom. And remember, you are loved. God bless.